डॉक्टर स्वाति कालिकी शी इज अ ट्रेन्ड ऑक्लर ऑनकोलॉजिस्ट एंड करेंटली हेड्स द ऑक्लर ऑनकोलॉजी यूनिट एट द ऑपरेशन आई साइट यूनिवर्सल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ आई कैंसर एट द रिप्यूटेड एल वी प्रसाद आई इंस्टीट्यूट हैदराबाद शी हैज लेक्चर एट वेरियस प्रेस्टिजियस नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल फोरम्स she has published more than 165 articles and 10 book chapters on various ocular and adenoidal tumors including eyelid sebaceous gland carcinoma ocular surface squamous neoplasia retinoblastoma ocular melanoma and various other eye tumors she is the recipient of many prestigious awards including the american academy of ophthalmology achievement award the asia pacific apao achievement award ICMR Shakuntala Amir Chand prize amongst many others we are so privileged and blessed to have dr swati kaliki with us who will be speaking on eyelid tumors diagnosis and management a very warm welcome and i request dr swati kaliki to please make her presentation for the post graduates okay thank you very much for the warm introduction i hope my uh, uh, slides are seen we can see but uh, can you make it full screen please yeah 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 is that fine now uh we can still see the slide sorter and the on the left hand side right oh i can actually see the full screen on mine mm. maybe you can stop sharing and again uh, yeah i will do that i will just stop sharing and then i'll reshare again uh, a very warm welcome to our moderator for today dr vikas khetan who has joined us just now he is a senior consultant at shankar netralay chennai and he will be moderating the session for today a very warm welcome to you dr vikas thank you sathi ji welcome swati thank you thank you vikas is the screen now i mean is it full screen now uh, not yet okay somehow i don't know this is uh, the it is made on keynote i'm not sure if keynote would appear as full screen on this i think even this will do this is okay this is also okay. yeah yeah probably i think it is because of the keynote thing ah, so I, now it's better now it's better Yeah, so I have just enlarged it slightly. I'll see if I can enlarge it more. This is good. Okay, so I have just tried to enlarge it. Anyway, so uh, a very good evening to all the postgraduates who have joined the session. So over the next few um, minutes like over the next hour we will be discussing about the eyelid tumors so in the beginning it is more like understanding about the various um, eyelid tumors so it's kind of little you may feel it like a didactic lecture towards the end i put as the pearls in the what are the practical pearls that are important uh, when we talk about uh, eyelid tumors so when we talk about eyelid okay is this uh, is this okay when i because if i don't keep full screen the animation doesn't work is this okay for for the display no, we can see we can see yes oh fine so uh, when we talk about eyelid tumors of course there are the benign eyelid tumors which can again be categorized into various tumors based on the tissue of origin so it can arise from the epidermis it can be melanocytic tumors arising from the melanocytes it can and there are various glands that are present in the eyelids so it can arise from the eccrine glands or the apocrine glands sebaceous glands of course um, where there are abundant sebaceous glands that are present in the eyelids it can be from the hair follicles there can be vascular tumors histiocytic fibrohistiocytic tumors lymphoid tumors and various other tumors so uh, we may not be discussing all the tumors but i'll just be going through the important ones um, so that we get an idea about the spectrum of eyelid tumor so this is about the benign so once we finish the benign tumors then i'll move on to the malignant eyelid tumors 
So when we talk of the tumors of epidermis, these are the common tumors, the first two, especially the squamous papilloma and seborrheic keratosis. These are the two most common benign eyelid tumors that we see in the clinics. The other um, the tumors that uh, we should also be aware of are the inverted follicular keratosis and keratoacanthoma. So what is a squamous papilloma? So squamous papilloma is nothing but what we call as a wart or the skin tag. So um, this, uh, these are examples of squamous papilloma where it can be sessile or which is uh, seen in the first picture or it can be pedunculated as you see in the second picture. It can also have a cerebriform appearance that is in the last picture that you see that is where it has that particular surface what is called as the cerebriform uh, surface. So these are the characteristics that um, help us to diagnose a squamous papilloma. Of course, all squamous papillomas do not require treatment if they are small and the patient is not cosmetically concerned. We can just observe them. But if the patient is cosmetically concerned or if there are too many of them, then only then we go ahead with treatment and the treatment it ranges from simple surgical excision or it can be ablated with the CO2 laser or argon laser. Photodynamic therapy also has been described for um, squamous papillomas and even interferon has been tried for the treatment of these squamous papillomas. Now this is, um, this is um, pic these are the pictures from one of the article that you see which is uh, cited below where they have used a photodynamic therapy for the treatment of um, this uh, squamous papilloma that was present at the margin. And this is um, another from another article where interferon again has also been. So this is that cerebriform pattern that we were discussing. So in the first picture, you can see that it is a cerebriform pattern of squamous papilloma that is present, which again was treated with just injection interferon. So always surgery may not be needed. The second common one that we see is seborrheic keratosis. Seborrheic keratosis, it has that very classic stuck on appearance. It appears like something is just stuck over the skin um, as you can see in this picture. So uh, that is what we call as a stuck on appearance, which is very classic of seborrheic keratosis. This again is very commonly seen. Now, sometimes it is just a coincidental finding when the patient comes with some other um, pathology in the eye. Um, and the, here, so here it is important for us to know that when there are multiple seborrheic keratosis like this, this is called as sign of lesser trilat. That means it can signify a visceral malignancy. Almost um, the diagnosis of visceral malignancy, these skin lesions can appear. So that is why whenever there are multiple sudden onset of these seborrheic keratosis, we have to think in lines that it is just a precursor for visceral malignancy and investigations have to be done in that direction. This is another which probably we see less often, but it is quite common in the African American population um, where there are multiple pigmented seborrheic keratosis I, um, lesions that are uh, present, which is called as dermatosis papulosa nigra. This again Swati, can. Uh, one second, yes. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I think your slides are not moving. We are not able to see the slides. Oh, really? Um, which slide are you seeing now, Vikas? We are seeing just the first, uh, the benign eyelid tumors, the one that you were, you had shown the classification. Oh. After that, it's not moving. Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. I think it's because it's a keynote presentation. Yeah, I think this way you can see, right? But yes, only yes, problem yes. is uh, the only problem is the animations will be lost. But that's fine. I think I'll just continue with like this. Um, sorry that you missed the previous one. So th this was about the squamous papilloma that I was talking about where it is sessile, pedunculated and the other lesions that I just described. And um, these were just the examples of use of photodynamic therapy and um, also the interferon here. Then now I was talking about seborrheic keratosis. The stuck on appearance as you can see very classic in this picture. Um, that is a classic uh, finding of seborrheic keratosis. And as I mentioned, if there are multiple lesions, it is called sign of lesser trilat, where we have to investigate the patient uh, for a visceral malignancy. Um, this is what I was, uh, the slide that I was on, 
uh, what we call as dermatosis papulosa nigra where there are multiple pigmented seboric keratosis that are present on the face and this we do see in elderly population when there is sudden onset of this again it can be a precursor for visceral malignancy and we have to investigate in that direction. Now the treatment of these lesions again similar to what we um, discussed uh, for um, the other the squamous papilloma these lesions also all of them do not require treatment they can just be simply observed sometimes um, when they are uh, multiple they are large the patient is cosmetically concerned only then we have to go ahead with a treatment where it may require surgical excision or uh, laser ablation and they also respond to cryotherapy so we can do double freeze thaw cryotherapy over the lesion and um, these lesions would disappear with cryotherapy as well now this is an example of inverted follicular keratosis this is a very very rare tumor um, that is there but we should be aware of it because um, this when um, when it is present it requires treatment um, when it is very very small probably we can observe but when it needs surgical excision we have to completely excise the lesion otherwise it causes rapid recurrence if it is incompletely excised the other lesion that um, uh, which is which comes under the tumors of the epidermis is keratoacanthoma. Uh, some of them even uh, put it as a low grade squamous cell carcinoma, so though it is described as benign, but uh, some pathologists have described this as a low grade squamous cell carcinoma. It has a very classic pushing margin that towards one end and it has a crater like on the other end. And this again, when multiple lesions occur suddenly, we have to think of a syndromic association. The treatment of this again, as has been listed, or if it is very small, we can observe the lesion or even use cryotherapy. Even um, the other chemotherapeutic agents have been used where we inject them locally and these disappear. Topical imiquimod again has been used, but surgical excision is the preferred modality of treatment, especially if it is a recurring lesion. The next is the melanocytic tumors. Now, melanocytic tumors, uh, basically, these are the three more, uh, the three common tumors that can be seen. That is a simple nevus. Then the other variant, which is called as blue nevi and oculodermal melanocytosis. I'll be showing pictures of each. Now, this is the uh, simple what we call as the nevus, the eyelid nevus. And this, again, based on where the tumor cells are present, they can be categorized as junctional nevus, that is if the nevus cells are present at the junction between the epidermis and the dermis, or it can be purely intradermal, where the nevus cells are present in the, derm in the dermis, or it can be compound nevus, that means it can be present both in the epidermis and the dermis as well. Now, um, this is a very rare variant uh, where it can be a giant pigmented nevus, um, till now, I probably have seen only one case. It's a very, very rare variant where the nevus is extremely large. But the importance of this is that, again, it may indicate that it um, there could be a brain melanoma or cutaneous melanoma. And um, these also can undergo malignant transformation. And so when present, we may have to excise these lesions, which would need extensive uh, excision, though it is because it is uh, limited to the skin. Um, it, though it is a large area that we would be uh, removing, a skin graft would suffice for the reconstruction. The next is a kissing nevus. Now, here is an example of kissing nevus that you can see where um, I'm sure many of you have read about kissing nevus, where if the nevus cells, they get um, deposited in the eyelid before the separation of the eyelid, which usually happens at about fifth month of gestation, then it uh, when the eyelid gets separated it the nevus cells are present both in the upper lid and the lower lid um, that is what we call as kissing nevus so here is an example now the treatment of this again all lesions need not be excised um, and even if excision is required extensive excision is really not needed here is an example where we have done just epithelial stripping that means just with cautery we would just remove the superficial layer because it is limited because it is arising from the melanocytes it is limited to the epidermis so we would just do epithelial stripping and they heal well of course it would leave a scar because of the extensive you can see that in this picture the nevus has completely nicely disappeared but there is a scar because of the 
um, extensive suturing that has happened, but still it gives better, uh, cosmetic results which are better than extensive excision involving the full thickness of the eyelid. So we do not need to do full thickness excision, just epithelial stripping is sufficient. And for those who are interested, we have even published a paper on this. Um, you can um, read that paper. You, if you go on PubMed, you'll find the paper, which is an interesting read. Now, here is an example of a blue nevus. This again is extremely rare. I have not seen a case uh, till now, uh, mainly uh, like, you know, it's uh, there in the literature, uh, but it is important to know about this because it is not as simple as a simple eyelid nevus. It has more, it looks more bluish in color and it, it is more common in females. And this again, there is a, a, a chance of for transformation into a cutaneous melanoma and is associated with brain or the orbit melanoma. So it's it is important to know about this variant. Next is the oculodermal melanocytosis. Now oculodermal melanocytosis, I'm sure many of you would have seen a case because this is pretty common lesion that we see in our OPDs. Um, most of them are unilateral, but sometimes it can be bilateral as well. And this is like a birthmark. The, um, you know, the patients are born with it. So they have ipsilateral melanocytosis of the skin and ocular. So if it is associated with skin pigmentation, then we call it as oculodermal melanocytosis. If it is only the skin, then it is just dermal melanocytosis. If it is both components, ocular and dermal, then of course it is oculodermal melanocytosis. And uh, here the importance is that the risk of cutaneous melanoma is rare in these patients, but they have risk of uveal melanoma. So one in 400 cases develop a uveal melanoma. So periodic fundus examination is very, very important. Even if the patient is fine during the first visit, we have to uh, counsel the patient that they would require periodic fundus examination. When I say periodic, a minimum at least yearly examination has to be done so that the uh, melanoma can be caught early. Now next coming to the sebaceous gland tumors, the benign sebaceous gland tumors, the common ones are the senile sebaceous gland hyperplasia and sebaceous adenoma. Now this again is a pretty common lesion that we uh, do see, especially if um, like you know, the uh, patients can, middle-aged patients, they can come with these uh, skin colored um, enlarged uh, lesions that are uh, present. Um, so these are uh, the lesions um, that uh, may require uh, treatment, especially if the patient is cosmetically concerned. Here it is important also to know that when there are multiple sebaceous adenomas that are present, then we call it, uh, it can be associated with Moir-Torre syndrome, which again is important because it, it can mean that the patient is likely to develop visceral malignancy in future it precedes visceral malignancy by about five years. So whenever we see multiple sudden onset of sebaceous adenomas, we have to investigate the patient for visceral malignancy. So as we have seen, there are a lot of these benign tumors which indicate visceral malignancy. So whenever you see multiple lesions, we have to keep this in mind and we have to investigate them further. Now coming to the sweat gland tumor, so they can be, so these, um, I think these are mainly um, diagnosed on histopathology. We may not be able to diagnose accurately based on our um, clinical examination. They're mainly histopathological diagnosis. Um, so they can be syringoma, the pleomorphic adenoma, eccrine acrospiroma, and uh, syringocystadenoma papilliferum. Now, syringoma, it's a very, it's one of the common uh, type of tumors where um, we do see these multiple waxy nodules that are appearing in the upper and the lower eyelid. Uh, so it is a sweat gland tumor, so they can be seasonal as well. So they are more common when it is summer season and it can have the, va um, the waxing and waning effect because of the, depending on the activity of the sweat glands in, the, in these areas. Um, now, this is um, a picture of pleomorphic adenoma. This again, it's a rare tumor. So this is uh, from one of the article where um, you can see that there is a nice well-defined lesion that can be present in the eyelid and a complete excision is recommended whenever it is present because if it is incompletely excised, it can undergo malignant transformation. 
then eccrine acrospiroma uh, when um, uh, this is uh, this is arising from the eccrine glands it it appears as a flesh colored lesion and it can look like a keratoacanthoma that we have seen in the previous slides um then the other tumors are the syringocystadenoma papilliferum it is um it it is mostly seen with nevus sebaceous of odison which again is um, it's a rare uh, entity but um, we do see quite a few cases because it's a referral center probably that's the reason we do see quite a few cases of nevus sebaceous of odison and these patients can have this uh, lesion which arises from the apocrine glands then there are various cystic tumors that can occur in the eyelid that is eccrine hydrocystoma apocrine hydrocystoma Uh, milia, the sebaceous cyst, the epidermal inclusion cyst, and dermoid cyst. Now, apocrine hydrocystoma it appears as a bluish nodule involving the eyelid, and um, this sometimes may be confused with malignant melanoma. It's a benign lesion, but uh, because of the uh, discoloration, it may be confused with malignant melanoma. But if we observe it carefully, it's not a solid lesion. It would be a cystic lesion, so transillumination would be positive. and it has a bluish color rather than blackish brown color um then eccrine hydrocystoma the, this again um because it it arises from the sweat glands the, this again can have waxing uh, waxing and waning effect um and it is uh, mostly seen during the summer times um, so climatic changes are seen uh, with these nodules and these are usually skin colored nodules and um, they would be translucent and transillumination would be positive the epidermal inclusion cyst again this again is a pretty common lesion that we see where it is slightly yellowish in color and um, this can be secondary to even like you know trivial trauma uh, so epidermal inclusion cyst um, is another lesion that can occur and dermoid cyst is a very very common lesion that we see um, uh, so it 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 is present in the subcutaneous plane and it is be because of the sequ so it is the dermoid contents so that it is because of the sequestration of the ectoderm which occurs at most commonly at the zygomatic or frontal suture but of course it can um, uh, occur in other um, areas as well but mostly it is associated with one of the suture lines and whenever this is present it is important to um, palpate the posterior extent of the lesion if the posterior extent of the lesion is not palpable then it is advisable to get an imaging to see if there is an orbital component so that is like you no know, it can have dumbbell configuration where a part of it is beneath the skin and part of it is in the orbit so dumbbell configuration can be present so before planning surgical excision an imaging may be required in these cases then these are some of the hair follicle tumor so here are the pictures which can arise from the hair follicles one of the common one of the hair follicle tumors is pilomatrixoma this has a very um, uh, specific features like when you actually palpate this lesion it is very it has that it gives a very gritty sensation it's quite firm to hard lesion it appears as a subcutaneous mass and mostly present in the upper brow um, area and it has a very very interesting histopathology as well it which where it has that shadow cells uh, which appear like pink and then the uh, cells were Uh, with with the nuclei which appears purple it's a very beautiful histopathology picture whenever um, there is a pilomatrix soma case the other the common ones are the vascular tumors um now vascular the one of the common vascular tumors that we see is uh, the capillary hemangioma or the infantile capillary hemangioma um it is very it is quite common that it is present in about 10% of the infants and it has a natural history that it is usually not present at birth it appears after the first 2 weeks of birth it enlarges in the first 6 months and it reg it starts regressing uh, with time and by 5 years it completely regresses in most of the cases um after 5 years if it still persists then sometimes um, it may require uh, like you know uh, the treatment including excision in these cases uh now the uh, infantile capillary hemangioma it can be superficial or it can be deep or it can have a combined um, it can be combined where there is part of it is superficial part of it is deep and you can make out the difference between the superficial and deep and what the what we classically describe as strawberry like lesion is the superficial um, infantile capillary hemangioma as you see in the picture towards the left where um, it is that strawberry colored um, discoloration that is seen in the skin if it is a deep component then the skin the overlying skin may not have any discoloration or sometimes there may be slight bluish discoloration and by palpation um, uh, and sometimes by imaging 
uh, we can um, uh, kind of like you know uh, definitely make a definitive diagnosis sometimes the deep component of this um, infantile capillary hemangioma may be confused with lymphangioma in these cases the uh, when we do it with imaging with contrast helps to differentiate between the two um, okay, here there was animation. I'm sorry, I can't show the animation. But anyway, so this is a child who presented with a hemangioma, but you can see that um, hemangioma is very, very small. It's like, you know, present only in the, the child does not have any ptosis, nothing. It's only the kind of like, you know, if they're cosmetically concerned, only then um, it would require removal. Otherwise, you can simply observe. So all hemangiomas do not require treatment. Um, though this child is definitely like you know close to five years or maybe slightly above five years and there is still residual lesion that is present but does it require any treatment probably not unless the parents are cosmetically concerned about it when, when do we need treatment so treatment is um, required when there is severe ptosis which is covering the pupillary axis or the lesion is quite heavy that it is causing astigmatism. It is inducing astigmatism. Only in these cases, treatment is required. And various forms of treatment are include um, steroids, which have been popular previously, but now the first line of treatment is propranolol. Um, then the others, like even interferon has been used and other chemotherapeutic agents have been used in uh, refractory cases. Even laser treatment has been used, especially in dermatology practice and surgical excision. Sometimes if it is a deep component, now surgical excision may be required. Um, here is um, an example of we, we hardly use steroids now. So this is uh, one of the picture from the article where you can see that uh, with uh, steroids, it um, kind of like, you know, it shrinks. Um, the general dose that we use is one to two milligram per kg body weight. And the response is seen in about uh, two to three months. Intralesional steroids, again, previously it used to be done very, very commonly using de combination of dexamethasone and triamcinolone. Again, now we rarely do it. Um, uh, most common one that the more the primary modality of treatment now is oral propranolol. So this is the same patient that I showed you in the first picture. And you can see that um, oral propranolol has been used for this child. And this is just one, um, I think two months after treatment, you can see that the child's ptosis has completely, um, I mean, drastically improved, uh, though there is still um, the minimal ptosis that is present, but there is drastic improvement. Um, the dose that we use is, uh, at least the protocol that I follow is we start with one milligram per kg body weight, we give it for one week. Um, and then the reason that um, we give for one week and then reassess is only to see if the child is tolerating the drug well. Um, because it's a beta blocker, uh, we have to be careful that we cannot give it if the patient already has a cardiac problem or a respiratory problem. Uh, we have to get a physician fitness before we start oral propranolol and then start it. And uh, at one week, if the child is tolerating the drug well, then we increase the dose to two milligram per kg body weight and the treatment is continued till the desired response is got. <coughs> what do we mean by desired response? So desired response is not complete disappearance of the lesion. Desired response is when the ptosis completely disappears and when the astigmatism that if the patient would have had before, that completely disappears. So for this patient now, um, as you can see in the picture after treatment, there is improvement of ptosis. So the child's vision is no longer obscured and the child did not have astigmatism as well. So do we continue oral propranolol? Um, we can counsel the parents that this is, um, it will have a natural course and it is going to kind of like, you know, come down with time. And we can gradually stop oral propranolol. And when we stop oral propranolol, we cannot stop it abruptly. It has to be like steroids, um, where you taper the oral propranolol over a period of time and stop it. Otherwise, there will be rebound phenomenon where if they stop suddenly, then the patient will again have a recurrence of this lesion. So it has to be stopped very gradually. Now, this is again the same um, uh, child where you can uh, see I had animation again for this. But um, anyways, you can see the composite picture here with time. The deeper component of uh, uh, the lesion has nicely regressed. Um, so the first picture, as you can see, it's kind of pushing the lower eyelid up and coming in the visual axis. And then gradually with time, uh, it started improving. 
um, in this child, though the visual access was clear, we still had to continue oral propanol because you, you can see that there is displacement of globe as well. Um, the globe is kind of pushed up. So that itself can induce astigmatism in these patients. Um, so uh, we continued oral propanol in this patient. And you can see in the last picture, there is just minimal residue. And at that point of time, the child did not have any um, astigmatism or anything. And then we stopped treatment gradually again, as I mentioned. Uh, where we taper the oral propanol and then stop it. Now, this is from one of the article where topical timolol also has been used for um, the superficial variant of uh, the infantile capillary hemangioma. As you can see, um, that is the topical timolol drops. It's just kind of like, you know, applied over it or the gel that that um, is available, the timolol gel that is available. It is just applied over um, the superficial component and that also helps. Um, this is uh, from another article where they have used interferon alpha. I do not have personal experience of using interferon alpha for infantile capillary hemangioma, but there are um, kind of a few reports where they have shown that uh, interferon also helps for infantile capillary hemangioma. Surgical excision is rarely required, as I mentioned, um, where it is a deep component. Now, neural fibers, that is the neurofibroma, the neurilemoma, now, it can be um, a solitary lesion or it can be diffuse lesion. Now, here you can see that this patient had a diffuse um, lesion, neurofibromatosis of the left eye. And um, these are two different patients, the first and the second. Um, this again, I have just put this. How do we manage these cases? So when we have just a solitary lesion, like if you see in the below picture, in the right eye, in the eyebrow area, there is a solitary lesion which we can simply excise and allow um, and leave the skin raw and it will heal nicely. Um, but if it is causing ptosis, significant ptosis like you see um, in the left eye, then in these patients, we, what we do is what we call as template technique. Template technique means we obtain the template of the opposite eye and the similar dimensions of the eyelid are um, kind of like you know, marked on the eye, on the side where there is diffuse neurofibromatosis and we excise the extra uh, skin and the subcutaneous tissue. That is what we call as template technique. So all that that is marked, uh, what you see in this mustard color is what would be excised. And what you see in the red um, outline is the actually the template from the opposite eyelid. So that is what you would retain and the what is in the mustard, that is what you would excise. So this is the same patient after the template technique. You can see that the extra skin has been removed. And um, obviously the LPS would not be normal in these cases uh, because we have to excise a lot of LPS as well. And um, the LPS is completely infiltrated by the neurofibromatosis tissue. So they do not have normal functioning LPS. So they would require a tarsofrontal sling, which, which is what has been done for this patient. And you can see in the below picture um, that his visual axis is nicely clear now. But we have to understand and also counsel the patients that there can be recurrence um, because the neurofibromatosis tissue, in um, the, it can infiltrate the tissue even after surgical excision. So that is something that we have to counsel the uh, patients about. Now, next coming to the malignant tumors of the eyelid. So malignant tumors, the more common ones that I'll be talking of only the common ones that we see. Um, now, when we look at the literature from the West, the most common uh, malignant tumor of the eyelid is basal cell carcinoma. About 90 to 95% of the cases are basal cell carcinoma. But that is not the case when we uh, look at our Indian data. Our Indian data suggests that sebaceous gland carcinoma, the proportion of sebaceous gland carcinoma is much more when compared to that of basal cell carcinoma. In our population, basal cell carcinoma, it constitutes only about 20% of the cases. About 60% of our eyelid malignant tumors are sebaceous gland carcinoma. Now, basal cell carcinoma. So, basal cell carcinoma it arises from the pluripotent germ cells, and um, it more most commonly it arises from the lower eyelid, um, followed by the medial canthus area, upper eyelid, and then the lateral canthus. Now, it can have different clinical variants. Now, the importance of knowing about these clinical variants is um, the two important things here. One is the morpheiform variant, which I'll show you example in the next slide, and um, the multicentric variant, where it can have in one area, it may be more um, kind of like, you know, obvious. In the other area, it may be less obvious. So multicentric tumors can also be present. Now, this is an example of morpheiform uh, basal cell carcinoma. 
where here the clinically visible uh, tumor uh, margins actually um, they exceed the actual margins exceed the clinically visible tumor margins. We uh, see very few cases of these uh, morpheiform uh, basal cell carcinoma, but it is very, very common in the West. And then it can have syndromic association. Uh, you can go back and read about the syndromic associations of the basal cell carcinoma, the common one being the gorlin -Gol, uh, golds syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant condition where they have multiple basal cell carcinomas. Um, over the like you no know, entire body they can have, but more commonly it involves the face and eyelids are involved in about 25% of the cases. Now, uh, when we are dealing with basal cell carcinoma, now the excision, the treatment of basal cell carcinoma is when it is a small lesion, you go ahead and excise with four millimeters margin around the lesion, like you can see in the second picture, where um, we have taken a good amount of margin around that small lesion that is present and we close that lesion primarily. But if it is an extensive lesion, of course, uh, it would require uh, much more um, reconstruction, uh, examples of which I'll be showing in the subsequent slides. Um, exenteration may be required if there is uh, orbital extension and um, EBRT, um, again, sometimes may be required in cases where surgical excision is just not possible. The other new form of treatment that is being used is the topical imicromod 5%, which again is an effective treatment uh, for basal cell carcinoma. Now this is a um, this is uh, from one of the article where um, they have shown that imicromod uh, treatment it helps um, in uh, the treatment of these basal cell carcinoma. Here is an example from the same article where um, you can see that the patient. If you see the second picture, there it looks like the lesion has actually increased in size. So that is something that is expected when we use imicromod um, cream. Uh, because um, there would be kind of like you know inflammation and uh, irritation that occurs because of the cream and uh, because of the drug and um, there would be in because of the inflammation the t the tumor appears larger in the first few visits of the patient and then subsequently it starts decreasing in size and it has been shown to have good effect. Now here is another um, uh, article which I found interesting where they have. Uh, uh, compared the results between use of uh, topical imicromod and radiotherapy and they have shown that it uh, both these treatments um, they kind of show comparable results so the imicromod uh, cream is kind of like you know it is as effective as giving radiotherapy to the patient so it is one of the effective uh, treatments now i haven't put uh, much about the other uh, newer treatment where like you know the uh, bismodigib which is being used for um, cases which are which cannot be excised. So that is one newer uh, development that has occurred in the field of basal cell carcinoma. Now squamous cell carcinoma, it occurs in elderly individuals. Then this again, it appears as a painless nodule. Um, it um, now basal cell carcinoma does not um, usually metastasize, but squamous cell carcinoma has more chances of metastasis to the regional lymph nodes and can have distant metastasis as well. And these squamous cell carcinomas, they can arise from actinic keratosis. Those arising from actinic keratosis, in fact, have a better prognosis. Um, and again, th this again has a variety of treatments, but uh, most of the, um, if it is small, then it can be surgically excised. Now, malignant melanoma, again, it is rarely seen in our population. Um, it can be, again, the variants that we generally read in about uh, skin melanomas where it can be nodular, superficial spreading or lentigo maligna. And the treatment um, in these lesions is in the lines of any other malignant tumor where we uh, do wide excisional biopsy. For malignant melanoma, in fact, um, the margins are recommended to be much larger, like, you know, more than four millimeters, about five millimeters margin is what um, generally many um, surgeons follow across the world. Next, coming to the important component, which is much more uh, kind of like, you know, um, uh, important for, for our population is the sebaceous carcinoma. So it is the most common eyelid malignancy that we see in Indian population. It can arise from meibomian glands, from the Zeiss glands, from the caruncle, because there can be sebaceous glands in the caruncle or it can have multicentric origin. Most commonly, it involves the upper eyelid for the obvious reason that there are more um, amount of uh, meibomian glands that are present in the upper eyelid um, compared to that of lower eyelid or anywhere else. Now, it is one of um, the uh, tricky tumor that it can be a masquerade. Now, if you see the first picture, it appears like it is a simple chalazion. 
but if you see closely you can see that the patient actually has loss of eye loss of eyelashes and all that so that is what you have to look for and you have to always avert the eyelid and examine the lesion always whenever you see an eyelid nodule always please avert the eyelid and examine so you can see the second picture is the same patient after eversion um, um, as you can see there is a large nodular ulcerative lesion which is hiding beneath so unless you evert the eyelid you will not be able to identify this lesion so that is why we sometimes have cases where it is misdiagnosed and mistreated as chelation and then when when they come to us it's already very very large um, now the second the below picture that you see is um, is an example where it can resemble blepharitis where there is diffuse eyelid thickening and they would have changes in the um, eyelid that there is the eyelid is thick there is loss of eyelashes there is redness there is ulceration that is present it can be associated with conjunctival congestion because of the irritation that is happening um so it can resemble a blepharoconjunctivitis or a blepharitis so uh, we should be aware of um, these masquerades um, that can occur with uh, sebaceous gland carcinoma now how do we manage these um, now management it can be simple excisional biopsy Uh, where now, so this is the patient where excisional biopsy is being done. So the markings are four millimeters from the clinically visible margins. So you can see that when we excise these lesions, um, they lose much more of the eyelid tissue because of the margins that we take all around the lesion. And then appropriate reconstruction has to be done. In this case, what is being done is the Cutler Beard procedure, where um, it's an eyelid sharing procedure where the tissue from the lower eyelid is being uh, taken into the upper eyelid and the eyelid is being closed. now the other important concept that we have to understand in sebaceous gland carcinoma is whenever there is conjunctival congestion associated with a eyelid nodule you have to suspect a uh, pagetoid spread of sebaceous gland carcinoma that is the intra epithelial spread and we have to do what we call as map biopsy that means we take small pieces of um, uh, like you know the conjunctiva from 17 sites the 17 sites are four from the limbal conjunctiva three each from the upper and the lower fornicial conjunctiva three each from the upper and lower tarsal conjunctiva and one from the carinkle so this makes for 17 sites of map biopsy that needs to be done now why is it important because whenever we see that there is pagetoid spread if it is limited if it is limited to just two or three areas then we can treat it with cryotherapy or even mitomycin c has been used but if it is extensive then it would even require orbital exenteration and that is why it is very important to identify this and not miss this now sometimes we can also use chemo reduction as seen in this case where it is a large tumor if i have to go ahead and excise this lesion i can go ahead and excise but it is it would be a very complicated eyelid reconstruction because the patient is going to lose almost the entire upper eyelid um the almost the entire like you know the lps <clears throat> lps and the patient may have ptosis even after reconstruction so in these cases chemo reduction can be done as in this case uh, where we have given systemic chemotherapy reduce the size of the tumor and then we went ahead and did excisional biopsy now you can see in the second picture that the tumor is small so in this the eyelid reconstruction will not be as extensive as in the first picture so this is um, one tumor which responds well uh, to chemotherapy and um, uh, should be done wherever applicable but of course we have to take into we have to weigh the risks and the benefits and choose chemotherapy versus primary surgical excision this again we have a, um, a good paper written about the use of chemotherapy for sebaceous gland carcinoma for those who are interested you can go to pubmed and you can get this paper and uh, read it now uh, so what we have to understand is that sebaceous gland carcinoma has the pagetoid spread or the intra epithelial spread in about 50% of the cases and that is why it is important in fact um, the map biopsy is recommended in every case of sebaceous gland carcinoma so that we do not miss pagetoid spread orbital involvement can occur in 20% the lymph node metastasis can occur in about 1/3 of the cases systemic metastasis can occur in about 12, 10 to 15% of the cases and death because of metastasis can occur to the tune of 40% which is very very high um so that is why um uh, diagnosing these cases early and doing the appropriate investigations to identify these cases early is very important to save the lives of these uh, patients 
Now, here is an example of now moving to the other malignant tumors that is a sebaceous gland carcinoma where a skin nodule may be present which can be firm to hard and um, here again it can have cystic component and thus transillumination may be positive. This again has to be treated with wide excision. Um, angiosarcoma is a rare tumor, uh, this, but uh, it is important to diagnose this because the mortality rate is extremely high with angiosarcoma. And this is Kaposi's sarcoma, which can occur when there is immunosuppression and low-dose radiotherapy is required. And Merkel cell carcinoma, again, is rarely seen. Um, I have seen only one case till now. It's, uh, it's, it's a very rare tumor, but this, again, it's important to, it has a very um, classic uh, like you know uh, color that it is more kind of like you know reddish violetish color color in this uh, picture of course it's um, it is more reddish but it can have violaceous hue to it um, it's important to know about this because it has high chances of recurrence lymph node metastasis and distant metastasis and island metastasis it's extremely rare again I have not seen a case for the past five years at least um, the island metastasis is extremely rare now, coming to the more practical aspects of how do we manage these islet tumors. So I'll be taking you as like, you know, the pearls in the management of islet tumor. So we have another 15 minutes. I'll try to complete it in 10 minutes so that we can take some questions. First and foremost, it is very, very important to establish the diagnosis. Um, so as you've seen, there is a wide variety of benign tumors and malignant tumors that may be present. First, when we see a tumor, the first thing that we have to uh, think is whether it is a benign tumor or whether it is a malignant tumor because the benign tumor treatment would be entirely different from if it is a malignant tumor. Now, in this, they look very similar, but one of them is benign, one of them is malignant. If you look very carefully, you can identify that the first picture is benign, first um, tumor is benign and the second one is malignant. Now, what are the differences between the two? So the first one, if you see, it is a, a kind of like you know a skin color lesion which is away from the lit margin does not have any changes of the lit um, the lit margin and the skin also overlying it it looks absolutely normal but the second one if you see there is more of intrinsic vascularity that is present and if you just kind of just lift the lesion a little bit you would see that the lashes are also sparse in that area so that gives you a clue and it is not a cystic lesion it's a solid lesion um, so that gives you a clue that it is a malignant lesion. So how do you differentiate a benign from a malignant lesion? You have to look for these points. One, um, ask for the history whether there is rapid growth of the lesion. That signifies that it can be a malignant lesion. Whether there is multiple recurrences of the lesion whether and um, palpate the lesion and see if it is a cystic or nodular lesion. Then look for eyelid margin telangiectasia, the lashes. If it is a malignant lesion, there would be loss of lashes. There would be rounding of the lid margin. If it is a sebaceous gland carcinoma, there would be effacement of the meibomian gland orifices and it would be associated with bleeding crusting. So these are some of the practical points that you have to look into to differentiate a benign from a malignant tumor. Now, here are examples of the malignant tumors. Uh, pearl number two, you have to be aware about the masquerades and this I think I have already discussed these are um, so these are um, these are uh, like you know uh, examples of very similar looking lesions but one is benign one is malignant as you can see the first one it is um, on eyelid eversion it actually gives you the whole story so on eyelid eversion you can see that the first picture there is absolutely like you know no ulceration nothing but the second picture, there is so much of ulceration, the uh, intrinsic vascularity, the uh, eyelashes also kind of look sparse in that area. The mebomy, there is rounding of the lid margin. So all these because it's a malignant tumor. So it's always important to, um, to differentiate it from uh, the masquerades that may be present. And this is again another um, like you know, the same sebaceous gland carcinoma. The first picture um, where there is diffuse blepharoconjunctivitis. The second one. So this lesion is very easy to miss. This again is a localized pagetoid involvement by sebaceous gland carcinoma. If um, not carefully examined, this is a very uh, easy lesion to miss. Now here you can see that all changes are present in the lid margin where there is thickening of the lid margin. There is effacement of the meibomian gland orifices. There is telangiectasia. There is increased vascularity in that uh, area. So these all tell you that this is a malignant lesion. The third pearl is you have to see beyond the tip of the iceberg. That is what we already discussed about doing a map biopsy whenever the conjunctiva appears. Even though we are talking of islet tumors, 
if an eyelid tumor is associated with conjunctival congestion always do map biopsy to rule out any intra epithelial spread in the conjunctiva the fourth and most important this is many a times missed that we have to examine the regional lymph nodes now for this we have to understand the anatomy so whenever we see that there is a malignant lesion involving the lateral one third of the upper eyelid it is more likely that it will drain into the preauricular lymph nodes now the middle one third it has dual supply so it can either the lymph nodes um, uh, the drainage can be to the preauricular or the submandibular the medial one third of the upper eyelid uh, it drains into the submandibular the in the lower eyelid the lateral one third goes to preauricular and the medial two thirds goes to the um, submandibular now this is very important to know because depending on the location of the eyelid malignancy we have to carefully examine the lymph nodes we have to uh, kind of like you know know where it is likely to drain so where it is likely that the tumor cells would spread the other useful way of diagnosing these lymph node metastases is sentinel lymph node biopsy which is um, we do not do it as a routine but as a few of the practices in the us they do sentinel lymph node biopsy as a routine especially for tumors like sebaceous gland carcinoma now this is an example this is a case of sebaceous gland carcinoma of the lower eyelid where you can see that the lower eyelid it looks like it is swollen on eversion of the eyelid you can see that there is extensive um, ulcerative lesion involving the entire length of the um, lower eyelid and this uh, patient had preauricular lymph node so you can see that um, there is a swelling that is present just in front of the ear so preauricular lymphadenopathy was present and we could um, we could take care of that by first we uh, 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 confirm the diagnosis by FNAC from that, and then be treated with uh, with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Sometimes even radical neck dissection is required in these cases, depending on the extent of lymph node um, involvement. Next is systemic examination. Now, systemic examination is a part and parcel of any malignant lesion, um, be it eyelid, conjunctiva, intraocular, or orbit. Whenever it is a malignant tumor, systemic examination. is a part and parcel of examination now here are examples of how the eyelid tumors can be skin markers for systemic malignancy like the acanthosis nigrans that i just showed you examples of where there are multiple sebo pigmented seborrheic keratosis it can uh, mean that the patient would have occult gastric tumors moitori syndrome which i again discussed that multiple sebaceous adenoma multiple epidermal inclusions is multiple sebaceous gland carcinomas it again can tell that the patient has visceral malignancy cowden syndrome that is multiple trichelemomas if they have then it can suggest that the patient may have or may develop breast or thyroid carcinoma the carney's complex is where there are multiple eyelid myxomas they can have uh, the cardiac or the cutaneous or the breast myxomas and when there is a uh, cutaneous capillary hemangiomas when um, uh, extensive then this these patients can have casebach merritt syndrome where it this is very very dangerous for the child because it can lead to mortality um, where they uh, kind of like you know it causes uh, thrombocytopenia and um, the child can suddenly die so it's very important um, that when there is extensive systemic examination has to be done to rule out this syndrome whenever there is plexiform eyelid neurofibroma type 1 neurofibromatosis should be suspected when there is port wine stain of course sturge weber syndrome where when there are multiple basal cell carcinoma it can you have to suspect gordon wald syndrome so as you can see many eyelid tumors can be skin markers for systemic malignancy the next is imaging and metastatic workup so when do we do imaging for eyelid tumors so all kinds of eyelid tumors do not require imaging so whenever you cannot see or you cannot palpate the posterior extent of the lesion like in this case where there is orbital extension in these cases you need imaging imaging can be in the form of ct or mri um, to determine what is the posterior extent of the lesion because depending on the posterior extent your management would differ um and systemic workup is important because the risk of metastasis with different tumors is different as i already explained with sebaceous gland carcinoma it can go up to 40% with squamous cell carcinoma it can be 2 to 20% basal cell carcinoma it is less than 0.1% um metastatic screen when do you do it you do not um have to do a systemic like you no know, whole body pet ct for every case of malignant tumor um if you do a thorough systemic examination with the help of a physician then uh, metastatic screening is indicated when the tumor the malignant tumor size is more than 10 mm or if there is orbital extension or if there is medial canthal location these are the indications when you do 
um, metastatic screening when, whenever there is islet malignant tumors. When do you treat a tumor? So when do we treat a benign tumor? All benign tumors, as I mentioned, do not require treatment. Um, now, the first case, it's the option given to the patient. If the patient wants uh, for um, cosmesis, then we go ahead and excise. But the second one, we definitely have to treat because it is coming in the pupillary axis. So the benign tumors, you can always give um, the option of treatment to the patient. Uh, or we mandatorily have to kind of excise only if it is affecting the vision of the patient. Um, this, I think the capillary hemangioma I've already discussed, so I'll not go into details. Um, the next, when how do we treat malignant tumors? So whenever we treat malignant tumors, it's kind of easier if you can um, uh, know the AJCC classification, that is the American Joint Committee on Cancer Classification, where the islet tumors, they can be graded as T0, where there is just um, carcinoma in C2, T1, so this is T1, T1 when the size of the tumor is less than 5 millimeters and it does not involve the islet margin or the tarsus, it is um, present in the caruncle, then it comes under T1. T2A, so two, uh, T2 has 2A and 2B. 2A is when it is 5 to 10 millimeters in size and it involves either the tarsal plate or the islet margin. 2B is when the size is 10 to 20 millimeters. Um, either involving the tarsal plate or the full thickness of the islet. Then 3A is when the tumor is extensive and has orbital extension. 3B is when um, it kind of like, you know, extensive lesion which requires orbital exenteration. T4 is where surgical excision is not possible. So this is the AJCC classification. So why am I telling this in treatment is because your treatment can be planned according to the AJCC classification. When it is a T1 tumor, you can excise the tumor. So wide excision biopsy with four millimeters margin. T2, again, you can do wide excision biopsy uh, with four millimeters margin as done in this case, where we have done a cutler beard and we have um, kind of like, you know, reconstructed the eyelid. When it is T3A, these tumors where systemic chemotherapy can be used, then you can use systemic chemotherapy. Now, this is a very good example how systemic chemotherapy has helped in this patient. The first picture before chemo, you can see that this patient had extend a lesion involving the lateral canthus and the lower eyelid and also had orbital extension of the lesion. So we gave chemotherapy for this patient and you can see in subsequent um, pictures after chemotherapy, the tumor became really small and we could just excise that small tumor and the patient did very well. This patient has completed, I think, six years of follow-up now and has no tumor recurrence and is doing very well. T3B, of course, uh, we have to go ahead and do orbital exenteration. And T4, where, they, where surgical excision is not possible, we advise palliative care for these patients. Um, so whenever we treat a patient, you have to not just treat the disease, but treat the patient as a whole. So for example, this patient, now this patient has lower eyelid basal cell carcinoma and also has upper eyelid ptosis, if you notice, in the left eye. So what we did in this case was, so the below picture is after reconstruction. As you can see that we have excised the tumor, what we did was a reverse cutler beard. That means the upper eyelid tissue was transferred into the lower eyelid. Now, because we have transferred the upper eyelid tissue to the lower eyelid, it has caused a little bit of retraction of the eyelid, which has also corrected her ptosis. Um, so in this patient, the ptosis is corrected and the tumor is also completely removed. So a reverse cutler beard is what we did in this case. Um, this is another example where um, this is a small tumor where um, here again, we have done reverse cutler beard. So I've just put this um, saying that reverse cutler beard is as good as a cutler beard procedure where they have excellent cosmesis um, without much uh, like, you know, uh, damage to the upper eyelid. Now, the last pearl for um, uh, the eyelid malignancies is follow up of the patient. Follow up of the patient is extremely important. Now, here is an example. So this patient had sebaceous gland carcinoma, underwent excisional biopsy, was lost to follow up for five years. And this is what the patient came by. The patient underwent exenteration um, because of she had pagetoid spread and all that subsequently. So she underwent exenteration and then lost to follow up. And you can see that she came back with large, like you know, the parotid gland enlargement, the preauricular lymph nodes were enlarged. She had systemic metastasis. So uh, the follow up of these patients is very, very important. So these were the pearls that we discussed. The easy way for you to remember this is you follow A, B, C, D, E, F rule when you um, deal with malignant eyelid tumors or eyelid tumors in general. A for establish an accurate diagnosis, establish the association with systemic disease. B stands for you have to be uh, aware of the masquerades and biopsy is indicated in most cases. 
C, you also have to look, take care of the cosmesis because when you excise these islet tumors, it leads to a loss of large area of islet. So cosmesis also should be uh, taken into consideration. D4, always diagnose the systemic metastasis by doing appropriate systemic screening whenever it is indicated. E, examine the lymph nodes. Do not forget the lymph nodes. Lymph node examination is part and parcel of islet tumors. And F4, follow up periodically. So it's not that you treat the patient once and you don't have to follow up the case no not at all we have to follow up these cases very very method uh, very very um, cautiously so i think i finished on dot so we, we are at six so i'm ready to take any questions if there are any thank you very much for patient listening very nice very. talk swati very very nice you. Any questions? Yeah, I'm here to question regarding the joint. Anybody have any question? You can unmute and ask directly, or you can write in the chat box. Okay, let me see. How to diagnose deep hemangiomas? Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, the deep hemangiomas, they would call the patient would have some amount of swelling of the eyelid. It would not be like, like you no know, reddish discoloration, but they would have swelling of the eyelid and um, it would have bluish discoloration. You palpate the lesion. When you palpate, it is, it, it's like, you know, not a very firm mass. It's kind of like, you know, you can, it is a uh, compressible lesion. Uh, and if you still are not able to conclusively diagnose, then do imaging with contrast. Because it's a vascular lesion, there will be very good contrast uptake. So that's how you can confirm that it is a case of hemangioma and not, you know, other mimicking lesions like lymphangioma or varix or any of these lesions. Before starting topical imicumor, do we going to do biopsy? So uh, we... Most of the islet tumors, except for uh, systemic chemotherapy, we don't do um, uh, biopsy as a routine. If it is a classic basal cell, because most of the basal cell carcinomas, it's, it's kind of straightforward diagnosis. So if it is a classic basal cell carcinoma, we do not do biopsy. We can start um, like, you know, imico mode right away. We do not biopsy. Only if it is an atypical lesion, then biopsy is indicated. Any other question? Anybody else have a question? Okay, so <laughs> doesn't look like. Hopefully, there's some addition to your knowledge on uh, islet tumors now for all the residents. No, I think it definitely was. And I think all the six classes have been very, very helpful. So, you know, Monday to Saturday. And I, I, I attended, you know, classes on LEDs and conjunctiva. <laughs> you know, my knowledge is also increased. <laughs> But it is thank you very much for organizing this to both uh, Vikas and Dr. Sinha. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Swati. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Swati, uh, for the wonderful presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Vikas Khetan also for being here with us. Uh, most of all, I'm very, very grateful to Dr. Swati Kaliki uh, for making this uh, effort and presentation today for the postgraduates. Uh, which will be very beneficial for them uh, for preparation in the postgraduate exam also. Thank you so much. And I would also like to thank uh, Intas Pharmaceuticals, Manishji and Chandrasekhar uh, for bringing this all together. I'd like to thank all the postgraduates who are here this evening. And uh, thank you, Dr. Swati, once again. No problem. And from thank the bottom, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.